Carol, how's it going with our new Substack newsletter? It's going pretty good so far. We've picked up quite a few new subscribers, which is all you can have because it's new. But there's always room for more. And I would say that listeners should subscribe because reading our newsletter is like pulling up a lawn chair to sit a spell and watch us garden a bit. Or it's like watching us fret over our gardens in this heat. Yes, like that too. Anyway, everyone should go out to the Garden Angelus at Substack.com and subscribe. Because it's free. Free. Welcome to the Garden Angelus, where we talk about flowers, veggies, and all the best dirt. I'm Dee Nash from Guthrie, Oklahoma, where I garden on seven and a half acres out in the country. And I'm Carol Michael from Indianapolis, Indiana. I have a suburban garden measured in square feet. It's about a third of an acre. We call ourselves Garden Angelus because we are evangelists for gardening. We love gardening and we want you to love it too. Yes, we do. And we aren't afraid to spill the beans and tell all of our gardening secrets, the good, the bad, and even the ugly. But that's enough of who, what, when, where. Let's move on to this week's episode. Hello, Dee. Good morning, Carol. How is your garden? Well, it was hot last week and then on the weekend it was cool. Now it's going back to hot again. But mm. I I kind of sneak gardening in in the early morning hours. So I did, as I told listeners I would. I pulled the lettuce. It had started to bolt. And I'm getting better about doing that earlier. And all that area has been replanted with green beans. Uh, it was, by the way, the best lettuce year I've ever had. And I don't know if it's because of my growing lettuce like it's 1957. But uh, I'll repeat a link to that article. But it was a very good lettuce year. Good for you. So I wish the peas had been wonderful. The peas have been good. I've been picking a few peas, shelling them out, just like enough for dinner each, every other night or so. And then this morning, since we're recording on Tuesday, I would like to report that I have fertilized all the containers once again. I'm on top of it this year, D. Very proud of myself. I, I won't break. I won't break my arm, pat myself on the back, but. Pride goeth, Carol. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, because pro- there's all those weeds still out there. And if somebody said, you proud of this? All these weeds out here, you proud of this? Mm. Anyway, how about your garden this past week? Uh, I've been deadheading um, and cutting back every morning. I have to work in the mornings because it's hot here, like unbelievably hot. We went from, you know, that cool, cool spring right, to just blazing hot and Lots of people have been writing me about their flocks, paniculata, which is the tall garden flocks, because it looks all wilted down underneath, as do some of the asters when you cut them back. That's because it, I think that's because it got so hot so fast and the plants just couldn't recover. It won't kill them. It just makes them kind of unsightly on the bottom. But we're trying not for perfection. We're just trying for beauty. And there's... Imperfection's okay, right? We're not even trying for beauty. We're trying for enjoyment. Oh, okay. There you go. Works for me. So also I'm pulling out more Rebecca Goldstrom right now. There, It's popping up in places. And this is the perfect time to pull it out. When it is just about to flower, it elongates that stem and the roots get closer to the surface. And boy, you can get down at the bottom and just yank it out. And it's very satisfying. And let's see, I also cut back my smoke bushes for the second time, and I'm keeping everything watered. That's about it. That's pretty good. I would like to tell you that the Rudbeckia, I call it Rudbeckia, Rudbeckia. In my garden, I do have a nice swath by the vegetable garden that has never been there before, and I don't really have anything (laughs) else planted, and there aren't weeds growing up there, so I've decided to tempt fate and leave it there. So I have a spot that is over by the air conditioner and it is super, the soil there is clay. Nothing wants to grow there. And I put, and I call it rude Beckia cause it is rude, but I put it there and it's doing great. It's fully contained. It's, it's happy. And I will just shear it off after it blooms but elsewhere, I am yanking it out right and left because it's just too wet. And anyway, so why don't you do the quote? I will. The air was filled with the delicate scents of violets and primroses. 
Wild strawberries climbed the hedgerows. Bluebells carpeted the wood. Buttercups gilded the meadows, and birds twittered in the trees. Spring teetered on the edge of summer, and I was ready to greet it with open arms. And that's by Nancy Atherton in the book Aunt Dimity and the Summer King. I love that quote. I I was trying to figure out how wild strawberries climb the hedgerow, but I could kind of see that. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not here. I mean, wild strawberries just sort of sit. I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. It's fiction, and it can be anything at once. But I like that. Spring teetered on the edge of summer, and I was ready to greet it with open arms. Yeah. I, well, we have to. You know, you don't get a choice anyway. So if we're going to greet it with open arms, we should greet it with open petals, too. And that brings us to our flower of the week, purslane. That's right. Purslane. Portulaca and moss rose, or as you wrote, rose moss, but I always called it moss rose. It is moss rose, although it's not to be confused with moss roses, which are actual roses. Anyway, Portulaca grandiflora. What do you want to say about it? Well, it's it's not a favorite, but I always manage to buy one or two on impulse if I go to the greenhouse at the certain time. If you go late in the afternoon, they're all closed up. You have no idea what they look like, but this is a daytime lover's flower because it needs, it opens up in the middle of the day and it's beautiful. And then as evening arrives, it closes up, closes up shop and goes to sleep for the evening. So I have a real, um, I, I think it likes it. It's in my heart because it was the very first flower I ever grew as a kid. Really? Really? Yes. I didn't tell you this when we picked it because I didn't think about it until just now. Um, When I was a kid, we lived in this little bitty house that was on 26th Street, which was about 26th and Portland. People locally will know what that means. Little bitty house. And right outside our kitchen window, there was a window box that was actually on the porch. And someone years ago had put in portulaca. And of course, it recedes. And I loved, as a little kid, popping those seed caps and then Uh watering it in. And it was just so easy to grow, and it always looked great. And then then there was the time that I um, found a dead bird, and I had read about, you know, (laughs) I'd read about burying things (laughs) for, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that went well. Um, I buried it in that window box and totally grossed out my mother. And I had to dig it up and take it somewhere else. And my mom was really mad at me. But it worked. I mean, it was that thing where, you know, stuff decays and it feeds the soil. <laughs> yeah. I, you know. I was such a little Like weirdo. I said, I, I don't have childhood <laughs> memories of this. I, I do have many memories of purslane, the weed that's closely related. But... I would say, you know, this flower gives us a chance to talk about the circadian rhythm, that 24-hour clock that lives in everything, including plants. And so I'd like to say that the the circadian rhythm is strong in the moss roses because they are so, you know, they'll be open now, but by supper time, they'll be closed. Well, and it's like four o'clocks, which open about four or five o'clock, sometimes six o'clock. And then they stay open all night and then they close up the next morning unless you have a really cloudy day for some reason. And then they'll stay up. I think daylilies are another great example of that. They open up, they're open for one day, they're done by the end of day, and then you move on. So, but in fact, that's not entirely true. Some daylilies open in the middle of the night. So daylilies with green throats often open in the middle of the night, the purple ones. But again... Circadian. You know, the thing is, how do they know it's the middle of the night? And so I, I would know. challenge people, you could, if you want to go down a rabbit hole, because I started to go down this, I'm pulling myself out because I just don't have time for another rabbit hole. Search on this fun topic. How do plants tell time? Okay, that sounds like a fun topic to search. Um, I would say that also takes <laughs> us back to that butterfly book, too, because they talk, she talked about the circadian rhythm in it, too, and how... All human beings are attached to it. Butterflies are, moths are. So it is something interesting. And we also went to the Missouri Botanic Garden and talked about how easy this one is to grow. It is a succulent. It has little succulent leaves. So it stores water. Doesn't have to have a lot of water. Works great in hanging baskets. Um, 
And in Oklahoma, anything that works great in a hanging basket is awesome. And I, I was actually at a client's house yesterday for garden coaching and she had a beautiful portulaca. Um, the, you know, that bright pink one that has the yellow center that's got That's the one I have. That's, I I don't know the name. That is a beautiful one. And the other one that I also love, uh, we wrote down, which is Samba Pink, which is pink and white, has bigger petals, has the more open shape, great for pollinators. Anyway, wonderful little plant that you can just tuck in here and there. Yes. I would like to note that I do not believe that it will self-sow in Indiana. You talked about popping the little seed heads and... It will here. You know, I, I don't think it will in Indiana. But let me point out, I did it very purposefully. I popped those little seed heads and did it all the time. And so I had it every year in that little garden, but it was in a very protected place. Which does remind me of purslane, which does self-sow, which is a daggone weed. And yes, it's edible, blah, 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 blah. We're not talking about it. I got some gigantic purslane out in the garden that I was like, you are lazy, Carol. You need to get down there and pull that out. I have a real problem with it in my rock paths, you know, in the back garden. Oh, my gosh. The you would love those it, paths. It loves it, and it's very hard to get out of there. So there you go. Anyway, very forgiving plant, great little plant. If you forget to water it, it's a lot like coleus. It'll pop back up as soon as you do. Got to love that. Very nice. Let's move on to the next quote, D. Okay, sounds good. She is a gardener, after all, and gardeners are dreamers at heart. How else would they be able to look at a handful of seed and envision a perennial border in all of its glory? That's Nancy Atherton in The Aunt Dimity Slays the Dragon. And Carol wrote in here, or a garden full of carrots, because that's our veggie. Yes, and so I said to Dee last week, hey, we're writing these articles for Family Handyman. And we're always thinking, what should we write about for the podcast or talk about i says why don't we talk about some of these vegetables we've been writing about since we are (laughs) steeped in the knowledge of them after doing all of our homework to write the articles and so is your carrot article been published yet no it hasn't i had to make some changes to it and last week we had a funeral so um i had to make the changes she's probably making more editorial Um, suggestions even as we speak, because I went in and looked at it and I actually pulled it out some of it so that we could talk about it. So what do we want to say about carrots? Well, the thing we want to say about carrots is that they are not the easiest vegetable to grow. No, they're not, but they're worth it. Uh, There are many types there. They are worth it because, um, and this goes back, we'll, we'll talk about more carrots when we get to the bookshelf. But when you go to the grocery store, the it's a very limited selection of carrots. They were harvested a long, long time ago. And so what's most surprising about freshly grown carrots is how sweet they can be. Yeah, how good they are. They're good. They're really good. And the reason I know this is I have grown them in the past more than once, but I also get them in my CSA. And because in my CSA, they grew them all winter and they're now harvesting them before they go to seed. And we've been so lucky to get the type that are the rainbow type of carrots. Yes. I oh like my the gosh. Rainbow types. They're beautiful. They look good in things. They taste really good. Here's what I've noticed about rainbow carrots. I grew them once and also I get them in the CSA. You get a lot more of the yellow carrot than you do anything else. Fewer purples, fewer orange, fewer red, mostly yellow, but they're still just as delicious. Um, to talk about them really quickly in our zone, my zone in zone seven, I think that they grow better in cold frames and, um, I do them in fall. So if I'm going to sow them in the fall, I sow them directly in the cold frame. I do not set out transplants. You can, but I don't. And then I let them go all winter. And then once they go all winter, then I harvest them in early spring or mid spring. And I think in my climate, uh, a cold frame is going to be a little dicey in the wintertime unless you just like cover them with a straw mulch and they've, you, but you would have started them well in, in the fall. So they would be pretty far along. Right. And you could harvest them through the winter, but you'd have to cover them with a pretty good layer of straw. 
I'd sow them in the spring here. And mm-hmm. your notes say three weeks before your average last frost. So I would back up and I would be sowing them towards the end of April. And you said you would sow yours in the second week of March. Mid-March. Yeah, mid-March. Because it gets too hot here too fast. And they're, they're I'm just going to say it. They're a little bit tricky to grow and they like fertilizer and... I they're I don't I don't grow them very much. So I'm really enjoying the ones from the CSA. They take 60 to 75 days. Yeah, I've told this story before about a friend I worked with who had kids and they had a vegetable garden because they were trying to teach the kids this is where food comes from. Mm-hmm. Well, they failed miserably with their carrot crop, so she went to the farmers market or the grocery store and she bought carrots with the tops on and then they dug them buried them into the garden. And then the kids came out and they're like, oh, look, the carrots are ready. And they pulled out their store-bought carrots. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> I I mean, the dedication, I, I just wasn't that dedicated. I would say things like, you know what? The carrots didn't work, kids. Let's move on. Um, I will say that, this. I'm looking mm-hmm. at your example for watering. And how many ways can you say you need about a, the equivalent of an inch of water a week and if you don't get it from yeah. the rain, you should water deeply to soak them in really good. How many how many ways can you say yeah. that, Dee? Not that many ways, because we've had to say it a different way in every single one of our um, articles. I'm going to come up with a set sentence, and I'm just going to like copy paste, copy paste, copy, copy paste, paste. Copy, yeah. Because it gets to the point where you're like, yeah, everything almost takes an inch of water. Now, when I wrote how to wrote how to grow rosemary it does not but no. almost everything else i have so um one other thing about carrots is you need very deep soil and it needs to be very loose that's that's really the key otherwise yes. you end up with little stumpy distorted looking carrots that then you put on the instagram and said oh look my carrot looks like you know the monster from the deep or something with arms yeah, and legs from the and, black lagoon or somewhere yeah yeah so horrible So my suggestion is, you know, grow carrots if you want to. Yeah. We also, and, you know, those talk about weeding. I'm always like, yeah, you should weed. Don't be like Carolyn D. You do want to keep weeds away from carrots and other things without disturbing that plant because they they tie up the nutrients. Yes. And also if you disturb them too much, then you get root maggots. So, you know, it's fairly complicated. Um. So what we're going to do, Dee, what we're going to do. Yes, dear, what? When mm-hmm. this article has been published, you're going to send me the link, and then I will update the show notes whenever that is, and mm-hmm. our Substack newsletter. And so I will link to this, and then people can go through, and they can read all about the wonderful world of growing carrots. And, and I say the basic reason you would grow carrots is to grow varieties that you can't buy in the grocery store. End of sentence. Yes. How about the next quote? Well, I got to go back through these show notes because <laughs> the other thing, too, you have on harvesting, there's nothing worse than trying to just like yank a carrot out and it breaks off. Can't get you them out. dig them out. Yeah. And you're like, you're so mad at yourself. Ugh. Yeah, because if you break one off, it's the pits. It's like when you accidentally slice through a potato. Yeah. That you grew. Exactly. Ugh, so frustrating. Here's the quote. And this one, by the way, is not from an Andumity book. Dust if you must, but wouldn't it be better to paint a picture or write a letter, bake a cake or plant a seed, ponder the difference between want and need. And that's the first stanza of the very famous poem, Dust If You Must, by Rose Milligan. And I think it was written in 1998. I didn't put that in the show notes. It was written quite a while back, and um, it is a very famous poem. But I think it's interesting because I don't think people dust so much now. I think they're on social media yeah. all the time. So we could change to say social media if you must, <laughs> but wouldn't it be better? <laughs> yeah. To do something else. Anything yeah, else. Exactly. Yeah, like dust. Anyway, anything else. Yeah, go ahead and dust. Although, no, just go out and deadhead your stuff instead. All right. On the bookshelf, we decided to do a cookbook, which I don't know where I put mine. I read it. But I don't know where it went. Anyway, it's the New Southern Garden Cookbook by a lady named Sherry Castle. And it was, um, I thought it was really, really good. The tagline is, 
Enjoying the best from homegrown gardens, farmers markets, roadside stands, and CSA farm boxes. So I, you know, I get out of um, practice when I get all my CSA food and the food I harvest, I have to think of ways to use it. And yes. to do that, I need cookbooks like this. I just remembered where the cookbook is. I'm going to get it. You talk about it for a minute. Okay. So this one and the cookbook by Farmer Lee Jones, The Chef's Garden, these two are a wonderful set to include in your kitchen. And so the thing that I noticed was for every vegetable, and this is all about cooking vegetables, she has a little overview about the vegetable. And it's not really growing information, yes. but it's just like a really fun description or tidbits about it. And then she kind of rolls into the recipes. And so for carrots, she says, a well-grown carrot is bursting with intense, sweet, earthy carrot flavor that is enjoyable, raw, or cooked. And then she had a couple of really nice carrot recipes. She did. And she does it for all kinds of things. Beets, um, I, potatoes. She spent a lot of time on potatoes. Yes. And that, that I just cracked up when I was reading. She talked about making what she called soupy taters, which is creamed new potatoes, pairing that with something she called kilt lettuce or killed lettuce, mm -hmm. or I would have called it wilted, wilted. lettuce, where yeah. you, you put the hot ba bacon dressing on it. So they take a spoon and they put it under their plate. So then their plate has a slight downward tilt to it. And yes. they put their kilt lettuce with the hot bacon grease at the bottom. And then they put their soupy taters at the top. And she says that way the, the vinegar-based dressing doesn't roll into the potatoes and get them all wet. So it's interesting that she brought it up that way. What we did, because I make wilted lettuce every year for my grandmother's recipe, which I've written about on the blog before. It's very similar to hers. Um, we put it in a bowl, little bowl, little salad what? bowl. What? I mean, all this effort <laughs> to keep your, you know, stuff out of your soupy taters. I was like, that that's too much trouble. Just put it in a bowl. In connection. Well, maybe they didn't have bowls. Okay. I don't believe that, but okay. <laughs> or they thought this will look dirty two less dishes if we put a spoon under our plate. Well, it could be that. I mean, that part's true. So in connection with this book, it was a great book and I don't know where I put it, but it's here somewhere. I loved it. I thought it was very helpful. I thought I had one of the things that makes it Southern is it had a lot of field pea recipes. Yes. Because people in the South grow what they call field peas, which are beans. They grow those and they cook them in a variety of ways. Sometimes they're lima beans. Sometimes they're black eyed peas. I mean, there's just a whole group of those legumes that people grow. So that section was very helpful because you, because you know, I'm obsessed with beans. Totally obsessed. I did want to show Carol this. This magazine I found at, um, I think I found it at the, you know, like Target or Walmart. And it's a Better Homes and Gardens, one of their specialty magazines. And it's called Farm Stand Recipes. So if you didn't want to buy the whole yeah. book, you could just buy this. It's very, very similar, but it's a little more modern than the book is. And I'm telling you, there's some good stuff in here. Some really beautiful recipes. Is. And they do the same thing. They go by um, whatever the plant is. And Well, I got my copy of this cookbook from the library. Oh, and I got my copy on used from a used bookstore. So anyway, that is our book, The New Southern Garden Cookbook by Sherry Castle. Enjoying the best from homegrown gardens, farmers markets, roadside stands, and CSA farm boxes. We'll put links in our show notes. So I'm going to do the next quote. Dear old garden of long ago, part of my childhood memories, hollyhocks nod in the farthest row under the linden trees. That's best by Bessie Sherman. Where'd you find this one? I like it. I, I don't know. So we, we decided to talk a little bit about when it's too hot to garden because I sent something to Carol and then she's... Then our, a great listener of ours, Kathy, from Cold Climate Gardening also sent us something. So I'll tell you about my thing first. Okay. I've been on, I love the Magnolia Network. And I subscribe to Disney, to Dis, not Disney, Discovery Plus for that very reason. Uh, I just want the Magnolia Network and I want to be able to just turn on whatever show I want when I want to, not go through 
my direct TV. And yes, I still have both because of my husband. So there's a new show and that new show is called the garden chronicles. And they're only like 10 minutes long. I saw that. Which is awesome. And the first garden, um, was Oak park. And then the second episode was Blythe. Is it Blythe world or Blythe world? I call it Blythe world. Blythe. I think it's Blythe, Blythe world, not world, wold. Um, it is awesome. It is so good. You sit there and you just watch it. The first one, which is Oak Park, is um, Bunny Mellon's own garden, her her home garden. And just the way that they are able to do the trees and do, they have an arbor and alley, actually. And the way they are able to do that alley is really great. Cool. So now, Carol, you tell about Kathy. So Kathy from Cold Climate Gardening sent us an email, and she watched on Amazon Prime, where she says it's free, a movie called This Beautiful Fantastic, which I think came out in the 20-teens at some point. And Mm -hmm. the description is, it's set against the backdrop of a beautiful London garden. This contemporary fairy tale centers on the unlikely friendship between a reclusive young woman who dreams of writing children's books and a cranky widower. Facing eviction over her neglected garden, Bella meets her grumpy, loveless next-door neighbor, who happens to be an amazing horticulturalist. In the movie, by the way, the woman is reading a gardening book that is completely fictitious, uh, which is a whole nother topic about books that don't exist that show up in movies or even in books. And I was reading some Aunt Demody, and they talked about a book in there that I'm thinking, that doesn't exist. But anyway, so that's... And didn't Kathy say that she was like kind of frustrated because she wanted to read the book that's in the movie? Yes. But she couldn't do it. And so I thought that was kind of fun. That is fun. That is very fun. So let me do the next quote. Gardeners can never mourn for long. Too much is in the future. One lives in expectation. And if the reality attained disappointments or if nature fails you, do it all over again for next year when the weather may be kinder. And that's Francis, Francis Edge McElvain, author of Spring in the Little Garden. And of all the quotes that you've done so far, this is my favorite. And I was sitting here thinking, uh, right before we went on, I sent you a picture of a daylily that I can see right outside my window. And I was saying, today that border looks better than it did on my garden post that I just wrote, right? And so Uh we do always live in expectation. And maybe that's why I like daylilies so much, because every day is a new day. Yes. Could be. Every day is a new day. So that takes us to our rabbit hole. And your lady who wrote this, wrote this quote. I have a new lost lady of garden writing, and it's Frances Edge McIlvain. I think I'm saying that right. So... I wrote a whole blog post, and we'll put a link out there, but she wrote Spring in the Little Garden, uh, 1928, which is part of that Little Garden series that I've been finding these old women authors. I think this is so cool. I I sat there and wondered after I read your post, did all of these ladies from this garden club deal get together and say, you know what, we should produce our own garden books? Or did an editor come to them and say, hey, do you know, Francis, anybody who could also write The Little Kitchen Garden? Or the little iris garden or? Yeah, iris is in the little garden, peonies in the little garden. Yeah. I think, by the way, there are a couple gentlemen that wrote some little garden books, but I am completely ignoring them. They are not lost ladies. No, they're guys. Mrs. Mrs. Francis King, I think, will be the next person I go explore. She's actually the editor of all these. And I think she met most of these people through the Garden Club of America. Uh Uh-huh. Um. So anyway, but back to Frances, or Fanny, as her friends would call her. Of course they did. So she lived in Philadelphia, and so her family was fairly well-to-do, it sounds like, because in the census reports, they list the servants. Uh, so it's her, her parents. Her dad is like a drug manufacturer, a drug importer, or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, she had three younger brothers. One of them was quite a bit younger. She never married. They spent their summers at their farm called Glen Isle in Downington, Pennsylvania. 
And I found that the farm is now the place of a very nice upscale restaurant called the Orangery, which serves Tuscan cuisine. Very mm. limited seating, RSVPs only. Wow. But anyway, she. the other thing I found out, oh, my God, this was because I'm getting better at finding little tidbits. She mm-hmm. wrote this little thing in the Bulletin of Foreign Plant Introductions about iris insada, which is Japanese iris, right. which has I like a one. little strappy leaves. I well, have one. Her big mm-hmm. thing was she heard that you could use those leaves as a replacement for raffia. And so she tried it and she said, sure enough, they stayed tight. You know, they stayed tied. So she thought it would be a great idea to put this iris and sada all through your garden and then you would have like a ready grown supply of raffia to tie things up (laughs) okay Uh, anyway uh and then i'll leave the rest to the blog post but that was my rabbit hole i spent uh quite a bit of time chasing down francis the one thing i didn't find um i didn't find a picture of her oh well you know you know, I found pictures of a couple of them, but, and, and, you know, and I said, I, I don't really know about her life other than I think she was really in love with primroses because somewhere along the line, and I'm also getting better about keeping track of my sources. Mm-hmm. I saw where they sold hardy primroses at Glen Isle along ah. with some vegetables and things. So I think she was into the primroses. She probably was. And a whole chapter of Spring in the Little Garden is devoted to primroses. So I, so I would say she was obsessed with primroses. I think so, but I have no idea what her social life was like. I, I saw one newspaper clipping where she was at a dance, you know, back when they used to report on like a social dance and list every single person that was there, and she was listed. That Other was their version that, of social media. You know, I don't know why she never married if, you know... Maybe she she was born in uh, 1878, so Ooh. doubtful that she was dating somebody. In World War I, she was obviously a fairly 22. She's already like 40-plus years old. So right. I can't think that she was dating a soldier that went off to war and got killed, but you never know. Anyway, yeah. Frances Edge McIlvain, Lost Lady of Garden, writing. I'll leave a, I'll leave a link to my blog post. Your rabbit hole, we shouldn't do this right before lunch, D. My rabbit hole is all about my new big green egg that I bought Bill for Father's Day, wink, wink. Yeah. Is that, those are I a told smoker. Him. That's smokers, right? For yeah, it's a smoker know. and a grill. It does both. And I have, so far the past week, I smoked a roast, a rump roast. And then I grilled steak. And then I did, last night I did ribs. I smoked them all afternoon. Um, lots of fun. And with the ribs, I also made, um, I made baked beans, but I made them all from scratch. Like I I made the beans first and then I did the actual, I did a recipe for baked beans that was not my recipe. It was a new recipe and it was, it's now my new recipe. I like it a lot. So I did that and we can link to that. I'll link to the beans. It didn't have ground beef in it, did it? No, mine did not have ground beef. Mine had Good. bacon. I've had it with ground beef and I've had it with sausage. One of my sisters in law, she uses sausage. That's just different. I like bacon. I worked with somebody who just said that his best bean baked bean recipe is the best ever. And so we had some sort of a management cookout or something and he bought a big pan of these baked beans that had the hamburger in them and I took one bite and I thought, These are gross. <laughs> You thought these are not my thing. Well, I just linked to the recipe while you were talking. So you've got it. It's, it was delicious. I was really, I was really quite surprised at how good it was. And then that, that's really my only rabbit hole. And I mean, I'm, I'm still watching the lost kitchen in the afternoon and I hope they bring out more episodes of the garden chronicles or whatever it's called. Yeah. I'm, it's interesting they're only 10 minutes. I mean, that's kind of like a YouTube video link. It kind of is. They're very short. But you know what? They pack a lot into that 10 minutes. And they talked about in Bunny Mellon's garden how the light played upon the stone walls. And I thought, I have never thought about that. That's a very interesting thing. So you can always learn more. So that's on right. to our garden commissions. Do you want to go first or me? Uh, you can go first. 
I don't even know what I wrote. Let's see what I wrote. Oh, I'm going to be out of town this weekend. I'm going to the garden bloggers fling, but I still need to cut back more asters. It's the, it's the time of year in my garden when I realize I have too many asters. If you're still but cutting back asters, you have too many holy asters. Holy moly. And my one aster just wants to take over. So anyway, um, I'm still deadheading daylilies. Right now we're in the thick of daylily season. So I get an entire five gallon bucket of deadheads. Can you believe that? Spent money. That's a lot. That is a lot. And so in connection with that, I'm often asked why I do this when I put it on. Um, I put a little video on Instagram on my story the other day about deadheading and how satisfying it is. Um, there's Here's the reasons. The old blooms are unsightly. Um, if you're growing, you know, a parking lot daylily like Stella Doro, it doesn't matter. But if you're growing these great big honking daylilies like I grow, it looks bad. That's number one. And then the second one is they take away from the new flowers and you know, those flowers are only open a day. So you want the new flowers to look good. Sometimes they get on the new flowers when they're in bud and they keep them from opening. So that's reason number two. Also, if you have honeybees, you're going to have seed pods. This is a little technical, but there are diploids and tetraploids. Tetraploids don't set pods very well in hot weather and they're harder to hybridize. Diploids are easy to hybridize, and the truth is I get a lot of seed pods. The problem with seed pods are two things. One is the seed pod can burst, and then suddenly you have more daylilies that are not the ones that you thought you were growing, and some of them could be real dogs. The, and the other reason is I don't, I don't want to hybridize, so I don't, I don't have a section where I can line them out and all that stuff. Right. I leave that to the professionals. The other thing is, is it takes away from the plant to mature. That seed plot takes a lot of the plant's energy. I want my clumps to get bigger and bigger. And I posted a video yesterday, just walking around the garden. Sorry for those that I walked too fast. I'm sorry. Um, one of my friends asked me, do I divide my clumps? And I said, no, I don't. Unlike a lot of other perennials, they don't die out in the middle most of the time. Correct. So they just keep getting bigger. And the bigger the clump, the more flowers you have. So that's what I'm doing right now. Oh, and I'm picking cherry tomatoes. That's it. I am not picking cherry tomatoes yet. I'm going to finish pruning some shrubs this week. I did uh, help my sister on Saturday prune her son and daughter-in-law's sh- shrubs. We do it every year. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm going to tend the garden. And then summer solstice is upon us. And I guess it's tomorrow. And no, then I found this... It's today, isn't it? Yeah, it's today. It's, yeah, it's the 21st. So it's the today. day we recorded. Go ahead. But I also found out that on the morning of the 24th before sunrise, Mercury, Venus, the Moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn will all be lined up in order of their distance from the sun in pre-dawn wow. sky. And you can go out and see it. But then they said the best way to go out and see this astronomical phenomenon is to find a spot with an unobstructed view of the horizon. Like, I don't know where that is. Try to get there at least an hour early. And this is like the, th- the best viewing is an hour before dawn. So you'd have to get there two hours before dawn to you, so you can adjust your eyes for maximum visibility. Uh, so I'm probably not going to do that, but I'm, I'm just sure somebody will. The planets will be aligned on the 24th. Beware. There you go. Or it might be. The time of Aquarius. All righty. So is that it? That is it. We want to thank you for listening to The Garden Angelus. I hope that you've hit the subscribe button so you don't miss a single episode. We publish every week on Wednesdays at 12 a.m. Eastern Time. If you listen to Apple Podcasts, we'd love a five-star review. That helps us get noticed by others. And could you also share our podcast with your gardening friends? Word of mouth is still the best way to get the word out there. And be sure and check out our show notes for links for more information about today's topics, plus links to our own websites. And subscribe to our new Substack newsletter, The Garden Angelus at Substack.com, also linked to in our show notes. That is the easiest way to get all the information that we talk about in the podcast. And one of our listeners, Debbie, she actually goes and reads those show notes first so that she's ready for when we talk about it in the show. Very good. And if you want to help support us, use the affiliate links. If you click through and buy something on those affiliate links, we earn a small commission 
and it costs you nothing. It was lovely to chat with all of you over the garden gate today. Bye until next week. Bye, everybody.